Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome uh, to this event. You are at the digital prototyping using the all cloud product development stack event uh, hosted by SimScale. And we are joined with some wonderful guest speakers from Kitchler as well as Onshape. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Nolan Halliday. I'm a senior application engineer at SimScale. And I'll be your host and one of our speakers today. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. Um, but before we do so, I just want to remind everybody what we're here to learn about today and give a quick overview uh, of our uh, presentation. Um, first off, uh, we're going to have a discussion uh, from with Aaron from Onshape. Um, he's going to highlight the key benefits uh, of their cloud-centric design platform. Uh, to explain how modern product design teams can become more agile in their workflows. And then after this, you're going to hear uh, directly from one of our successful mutual customers. Uh, that's going to be Josh Levine at Kitchler Lighting. Um, and he's going to talk about how his group has deployed uh, the all cloud development stack of both Onshape and SimScale successfully. Um, and before all that, um, I think we're going to um, also, uh, sorry, we are also going to then have a lively discussion and uh, Q&A at the end, as I previously mentioned. Uh, first, let me just start by introducing who's uh, all going to be joining us. Uh, first off, Aaron Magnan, he's a product uh, marketing manager at PTC, PTC Onshape. Uh, Aaron attended the University of Nevada, Reno, where he obtained a degree in mechanical engineering. After almost 10 years as an application engineer, he found his way to technical marketing and has helped oversee Onshape's App Store uh, since July of 2020. Additionally, we have Josh Levine, who is a lead mechanical engineer at Kitchler Lighting. And he uh, manages the decorative product category for the value engineering team there. Uh, he, he oversees cost out related activities, including new vendor integration, design changes, and competitor analysis. And finally, I am a senior application engineer at SimScale. Uh, as an aerospace engineer by degree, I have a long history in applied CAE simulation, uh, both with uh, software vendors as well as an end user. Uh, in my current role, I'm helping engineers and designers apply the high fidelity simulations and technologies that SimScale has in their platform to help our customers build better products faster. Uh, now I'm going to turn things over to my friend Aaron at Onshape to start our discussion and kickstart things talking about the cloud native CAD solution. Thank you for the introduction, Nolan. My name is Aaron Magnin. I'm the product marketing manager over here at Onshape, uh, a part of PTC. That acquisition happened about two years ago, for those of you who are uh, paying attention. Um, <clears throat> so Onshape is a cloud native CAD tool, and obviously, before you get into simulation, um, you're going to be building up your models. You're going to be, you know, assembling them, ensuring all the proper, you know, motion is available, and and you can avoid collisions and things like that. And that's that's what Onshape comes into to do. And and what I wanted to do was just introduce everyone here to what Onshape is as a CAD tool, and then pass it off to Nolan and Josh to kind of bring it all home in terms of the the simulation. So. Onshape's vision and beliefs, this is actually pulled from uh, an event we just recently did on Onshape Live. If you're interested in watching that, there are recordings available. Our goal is to exceed the performance and pro productivity of you know, traditional desktop installed CAD or on-premise CAD and PDM software. Um, the way that the, the way that our users are, are able to leverage our, our CAD architecture um, makes it so that the more, the larger the team, the more dispersed the team, and the more complex the product being designed uh, only goes to amplify the, the very clear advantages of a system like our own. And, you know, SimScale obviously is another cloud native product. Um, we'll talk more about, you know, how they integrate and how we're all working with each other. And the last thing is, you know, people don't buy Onshape because it's cloud native. People buy Onshape because it makes them better, it makes them faster, it makes them more efficient, it makes them more capable of collaborating and um, sharing data, you know, internally and externally. So at a very high level, 
Uh, I just wanted to touch on this. We have about 3 million users, I think, of that number. I think there's like a, there's something like a million active users. There is a 99.9% .9 uptime. Obviously, if you're a cloud product, uptime is crucial. You know, any any little disruption is is detrimental to, to the business of our users. So obviously we, we want to ensure that that number is as close to 100% as possible. 99.9 uh, .9 is about as good as you can get. Uh, and I think, you know, obviously you can carry that out a couple more significant figures, but uh, that's, uh, we haven't had any significant disruptions lately in uh, knock on wood. <laughs> so, um, and, and in 2022, we had 17 releases. We, we, we operate on three week sprints. So there is something to be said about uh, the rate at which we're delivering new capabilities. Um, we'll talk more about how those are delivered and, and how it's, you know, of little disruption to, to end users. So, you know, there are quite a lot of benefits um, of this, you know, cloud-based on-shape architecture over a file-based uh, CAD system. There's things like, you know, advanced collaboration. Um, on-shape has something called follow mode. I mean, if you wanted to work with another engineer and show them something that you found, you 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 you, you open up the same model just using a hyperlink right and then you, you say hey follow me and they can double click on your icon watch you as you go and you describe maybe the problems that you've been noticing um there's things like on-demand analytics you know obviously with all these um cloud tools uh, analytics is is crucial to not only you know good performance um but also like figuring out where people are accessing your data from and, and who's working on what and you know, it, it'll help you maybe figure out um, lead times for, for your next design uh, phase that you're working on. So there's, there's quite a lot of value that you can derive from the analytics that a tool like this will provide. The, the interface is intuitive. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's any big secret that the, the founder of Onshape, John, John Hirschstick and John McElhaney, the founders, I should say, um, both started SolidWorks as well. So, I mean, they, they understand the approach to CAD, they understand the, the market very well, um, and, and they, they essentially built a, a very similar tool. Um, they, you know, improved on a, a number of things like the way that uh, you, you join parts together, you join assemblies and define the motion. Uh, there's, there's quite a lot of advantages to the way that we do it. So there's 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 quite a lot there in terms of the, the interface. I think that if you're you're using any 3D CAD tool today, you could jump into Onshape and you know get yourself to be very proficient in a very short amount of time you can access your designs from anywhere at any time from from any device you know it doesn't matter if you're on a mobile if you're on a ipad or a, you know android mobile device um you're on your pc whatever it is you you if you have internet you're essentially going to be able to access your your models and, and make all the changes and uh, security obviously is is also another you know key tenant to any any cloud tool. Um, and I, I you know this is one of these things where it's it's hard to get past that mindset of you know an on-premise tool. Let me let me back up. I, I think there's a notion that on-premise tools have you know better security, but when you think about it. Um, to get access to a data center like at AWS or I'm sure Azure or any of the other you know data providers, um, you need quite a lot of clearance. It's uh, it's a lot different than if you know someone has a laptop in the back of their car and someone breaks into their car and steals you know your design data. I mean, there's there's quite a lot that can be said about storing data on on the on the cloud and there's quite a lot of security built into that. Um, there's essentially no crashes um i mean crashes actually do happen but it would be you know something that you you wouldn't even notice you would just you know potentially like refresh your browser i i personally have never experienced a crash um or at least i've never been privy to to one actually happening because it's you know not in your face when when it does happen which um I think is is a breath of fresh air when you're coming from some of these other tools. And then the the auto updates. I mean, I mentioned there were 17 updates in 2022. Zero IT overhead related to those. They don't need to do anything. They don't need to run any service packs. It all happens on our end. Uh, all you need to do is refresh, and you'll see a pop up 
the next time you start on shape that says, hey, here's all the great new functionality that you can take advantage of. So it is a unified cloud solution, right? There's there's not just the CAD, um, there's you know data management and we joke about this a little bit internally. It's like, you know, Onshape is actually like a PDM tool with a CAD tool attached. I mean, PDM is really at the core of what we do and it's so crucial to, to you know, engineering tasks, you know, being able to find your documents, being able to check them out and work on them. You know, there's no check in, check out. Um, there's, you know, we operate at a, at a, on a different level. Um, there's quite a lot to be said about that. Um, there's accessibility, um, and and I think about that not just in terms of like being able to access your data from any device, you know, with internet connection. It's it's also like, you know, any you don't need specialized hardware. You can you can access it with a Chromebook. You can, I think there's a new blog post that'll be coming out soon where we're we're showing all these various funny uh, cloud connected devices that people have run on shape on. So keep your eyes peeled for that. And you know, we, there's there's release management, there's the app store, and obviously API, which is crucial to to like SimScale and our app partner infrastructure, right? You know, these are all things that that we've had, and in in the last year or two, and most of these products are are some of these are upcoming, like Cam is an upcoming technology. We we recently added simulation. We have a rendering studio. We have PCB Studio, so you can so you can collaborate across your your MEs and EEs, and and we have things like publications to to be able to share your data more efficiently. And so, I mean, as it pertains to this conversation, I think it's important to talk about you know one of these updates, and that's obviously simulation. This is a simulation webinar. Onshape simulation is built right into the tool. So if you can build an assembly in Onshape, you can also simulate it because all you essentially need to add is a load. You just, I mean, it's using all of your 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 defined joints or mates, if you want to call them that, um, and it will use those to to properly, you know, um, define the contact between all the the various parts. Um, you can define, you can take advantage of all the same tools that you leverage. So so once you've run a simulation, you can explode it out to to you know dig deeper. You don't need to create any special explode states. You don't need to create any meshes you don't need to do anything special as it relates to the simulation you really just need to apply the load and you're off to the races so it is it is you know for this de designer based approach however you know it's 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 going to provide you one type of simulation it's linear static which is probably the more common but you know obviously like in the case of kishler that josh is going to be showing you later they need to do different types of simulations if you need to do you know a um, you know heat transfer you're going to need to to leverage one of our amazing partners like like SimScale. So, um, yeah, there's there's quite a lot to say about Onshape. You know, we love working with SimScale. They they provide a ton of value to our our our, our user base, and um, I can't wait to see what what Josh is going to show. I think he has a lot of really neat things to 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 touch on as it relates to this conversation. Um, so I'm going to pass it back to Nolan and thank everyone for the the time that you gave me this morning to talk about Onshape. Yeah, thanks so much, Aaron. That was really fascinating stuff. Um, yeah, I think that Onshape and SimScale, we we certainly share a lot of commonality and actually a very similar even founding uh, time frame. Uh, and yeah, we definitely appreciate and value our partnership and how much you guys have also helped pave the way uh, to move uh, our type of types of technology into browser-based and cloud-based frameworks. Um, and we're getting a lot of really great questions. Your uh, discussion definitely sparked a lot of people's um, questions, and we'll, 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 take, we'll tackle those at the end, um, but do please keep them coming. Um, what I'm going to do now is take about five or ten minutes of everyone's time to just talk through uh, who SimScale is and, and sort of what, what we're bringing to the table uh, before I uh, turn things over to, uh, to Josh to bring us home and kind of wrap wrap things up together and show how he's uh, how he's applied both of our technologies. Um, so to turn our attention to SimScale, uh, just for those of you who are unfamiliar with us, maybe learning about us for the first time, I want to give a quick introduction to our company. Uh, we were founded more than 10 years ago, and, and SimScale was founded with the mission to empower engineers to innovate faster uh, via the use of high-fidelity engineering simulation. Um, and we want to make it technically and economically accessible at scale. 
So let me just break down, I guess, what how we're achieving that mission. Uh, first of all, we're making SimScale accessible at any scale by being powered by state-of-the-art cloud HPC, high-performance computing, and also web accessibility. Uh, so we kind of unlocked the power of very, very large high-performance data centers to power this high-fidelity simulations and accessing it through uh, through a web browser, which is something that I think every every computer has these days, and maybe every device has these days. Um, also, we're enabling engineers to simulate without any compromises. So what I mean by that is having a very wide range of different physical models that we continue to build on with every release um, and having nearly limitless computing power um, to tackle the, the hard problems. Um, and then finally, we're delivering all this through a best-in-class UI uh, with ease of use uh, at the forefront. And additionally, uh, backing that with world-class tech support, uh, which I'll, I'll get into a little bit more about how we handle that aspect of, uh, of our product. Um, in addition, we're going to streamline and uh, allow collaborative workflows uh, to, for you to work with the rest of your stakeholders and your team. And that's really going to be the focus of my talk um, for, the, for the remainder of my time here. Um, so just more specifically, when I'm talking about cloud-centric product development and the cloud-centric uh, product uh, um, development stack, what's really interesting is in, um, in the industry, we're seeing where engineering firms and companies, they're those that are making any kind of hardware product, um, they're really continuously trying to innovate and compete under very high competitive pressures uh, to reduce the cost of their products and also to have quicker uh, time to market. Um, so as part of this, the workflow that's surrounding that process uh, needs to also accelerate at that pace. Um, we need to start maybe developing hardware a little bit more like we develop software in terms of agility. So designers are demanding access to you know, really robust tool sets end-to-end, -end, encompassing things like design, simulation, and optimization. Uh, and being able to deploy that through a web browser, um, you know, that technology, as well as the cloud-based high-performance computing, has really led to the advent of this all-cloud engineering software stack. This makes it easy to roll out uh, this type of technology to global teams and give them access to simulation tools really early on in the product life cycle. Uh, it has really disrupted the traditional R&D workflow. So breaking this down a little bit, for, uh, a little bit more detail of what some of these agile-minded uh, approaches enable. First of all, this um, will enable these cloud-centric tools like Onshape and SimScale uh, will enable you to work better as a cohesive team. Uh, and, and what's meant by that is if you have shared uh, libraries, cross-functional groups can share projects and results really easily. So think about the way you share documents using some of the cloud-based document storage built into most of our operating systems today. Um, applying that to a, a much larger data set of uh, your PDM, including simulation. Um, providing a single source of truth so there's not local versions of simulations floating around on different people's machines and different HPC directories. Um, and then, you know, furthermore, this gives kind of higher level project managers and senior leadership a better understanding of uh, company-wide usage. Um, so, you know, data analytics, who's, who's doing what, who's in charge of what, who owns what and where it all is, can be kind of much more easily accessed at a 30,000 foot level. Um, and then finally, I alluded to this, but um, we're part of the team too, whether that be on shape or ourselves. Um, so being able to collaborate with the support you get from the software provider uh, is really fundamental uh, to having success and to getting, in our case, uh, simulation results in a timely manner where they can actually influence the, the shape of your pro product. Um, so cloud sharing will, it will assist with that collaboration every bit as much uh, with, with our support team as it will within your company. Um, let me just expand upon each of these items here with a, a couple uh, 
couple visuals from right from SimScale. So the first one I have here, um, hopefully you're able to follow along, but it's two users logging into a shared project. Uh, one user can request editing privileges for the current project and go ahead and run with the simulation from there. So if you have uh, an engineer who has maybe gotten halfway through or part of the way through a, a certain project set up and then is getting pulled into a high priority situation or maybe has an emergency come up, um, they can they can collaborate together with a, with a team member to pass the ball and uh, can you know ensure that these high priority tasks continue on schedule. Um, so again, this is um, something that Onshape and and SimScale both share uh, that collaboration aspect. Um, building upon that, um, we've made some really uh, recent large improvements to the SimScale's uh, dashboard. So this is sort of outside of the simulation where we manage, uh, you know, your organization manages their data. So this dashboard has been expanded for our team and enterprise account levels to uh, allow for what's called team spaces. So this allows a company administrator and assigned admin to uh, create as many spaces as, as they need and kind of tailor them to the roles um, of different groups and different users so they can start to identify different you know users and, and access levels depending on um, you know depending on their need things such as view privileges copy privileges um, or full-on editing privileges to, to change settings um, and all this is through uh, team spaces in our dashboard I, I touched on this earlier but we also provide very detailed data analytics about uh, simulation time, simulation spend, um, you know, simulation success rate. All of this can be exported from SimScale um, and drive data-driven uh, data uh, high-level company decisions regarding engineering and engineering efficiencies. Um, this is also very uh, useful for project-based billing and maybe firms that are uh, consulting to see actual spend on given projects. Uh, and uh, the, finally, the last thing, and you know, certainly not least, um, something that you know, we're really proud of is uh, the fact that our cloud-only architecture for doing simulations uh, enables nearly instant and very, very effective in-product live support from our, our team of experts. So projects that you have can be uh, very easily and very securely shared with our team to help diagnose and resolve any issues you may be running into. Again, this is just avoiding any costly delays, headaches, aggravation. Um, you can get simulation results and um, make informed decisions with them. And again, stay influential in the product development cycle. <clears throat> so I just want to like conclude before I turn things over to Josh for the remainder of our time. Um, so just reiterating, if SimScale is committed to democratizing simulation, uh, we want to empower every designer and every engineer out there to innovate faster and easier. Uh, and you know, within SimScale, your simulations are technically and economically accessible um, at scale at any location at any time. Um, so we want to break down these technical and economic barriers. Uh, we want to be computationally and organizationally scalable. And we want to do so through uh, the use of cloud computing as well as uh, web-based technologies. And we'll continue to build on that. Um, so again, don't just take it from me. Uh, I want to let Josh at Kitchler Lighting talk us through how his companies has successfully implemented this all cloud development stack and into just one of their uh, projects, which he'll share with you now. So again, thanks everybody. And that said, I will turn the ball over all right. Thank you, Nolan. Hello, everyone. My name is Josh Levine from Kitchener Lighting. And today I'm going to be discussing, obviously, simulation and then how it benefits Kitchener. All right. So just a little bit more about myself. A uh, mechanical engineer from Ohio State University. I've been at Kitchener for almost four years. And as mentioned, I'm a lead engineer in our decorative lighting category in the value engineering department. And our main focus is cost reduction. So just to give you some insight uh, about Kitchler itself, uh, we are owned by Masco Corporation, a public company. 
Uh, we're one of the top U.S. residential lighting suppliers. And our main categories include our decorative lighting category, which is what I'll be focusing on today. Uh, that's mainly focused on the aesthetics. You can see an example of it to the right on the screen. Uh, we also have an interior lighting systems category. This is mainly functional. This would be ceiling down lights or under cabinet lighting. Um, and then we also have a landscape lighting category. This would be things like path lights or accent lights. And we also have a large fan category as well. As far as Kichler and Onshape, our partnership has been around for about five years. And the main purpose, Aaron explained some of the, the reasons we would use Onshape, but the main purpose for us is to, to help work continuously with our international teams and share files on a 24 seven basis, uninter un un uninterrupted. <clears throat> uh, and then it also allows us to be flexible with our international supplier base by easily updating documentation without significant manual file sharing. It also lets our suppliers easily collaborate with us if necessary without constantly going back and forth through email drawing updates. As far as simulation goes, there are two main purposes for Kitchler to use simulation. The first would be cost reduction, and the second would be time reduction. So cost is a little more obvious. Uh, if we can reduce material, that is going to be a direct relationship to cost. Uh, we also will or can eliminate prototyping costs as well as testing costs. As far as time goes, uh, Kitchler is generally on strict project timelines, and that doesn't allow us to have numerous prototyping and testing time, specifically if we have significant iterations. Uh, this will mainly help us make more efficient designs within our current timeline. So the current project I want to talk about today is our LED wall sconce and a hub door fixture. You can see it on the left-hand side. This is part of our decorative category. Um, and specifically, we are working to reduce the material of the aluminum heat sink that you can see on the right-hand side of the screen. And then one design change that uh, impacted this project that we need to note is a switch from a DC driver to an AC onboard driver. Uh, and how that impacts us, it's cause two things. First is an increase in the module size. So you can see that's going to impact the heat sink. It's going to increase the platform size that this sits on. You can see that in the center image. And it also increases the heat within the center section of our fixture. Uh, we move the driver from inside of the canopy or mounting area to uh, inside of that middle cylinder. And then as far as thermal constraints for this project, uh, we have some, so the PCB is uh, important to us. Uh, it's got a temperature we want to stay below is around 150 degrees C. We also have two lenses here, the module lenses, as well as the fixture lens. Those are kind of have constraints of about 115 degrees C. And then our mounting component, uh, which we call a canopy inside of that mounting component, we need to have a temperature that stays under 75 degrees C. Then as far as our heat sink guidelines for development, our goal is to reduce cost through material savings. That one's pretty obvious. Uh, and then we are willing to sacrifice thermal efficiency as long as it does not interfere with constraints from our other components. Those are the things that I mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, just to give you some reference, the initial volume of that heat sink was 58.4 cubic centimeters. And then as far as our heat sink comparisons, um, we had many variations of heat sinks. I'm only going to show you a few of those examples and some of the changes that we made along the way. Um, so just an example of a change we make, uh, one would be height of different sections. So we modified the height of the fins, height of the ribbing. Uh, we also, when we had the opportunity, would modify the height of the overall component. We also changed the number of fins as well as the thickness of some of those fins. Uh, and then we did add cavities as well as through holes to multiple areas of this component. Uh, you could see one example in this image here uh, is on the back vertical portion of the heat sink. Um, and then we did change the profile in some instances. Um, some of those changes were, as you can see here, to the back vertical geometry. Uh, and we're doing this to make the design as efficient as possible, specifically geared toward material reduction. And then as far as simulation results, uh, to start this project, we created a prototype control sample, which we then tested. 
Uh, you can see the results of that prototype test on the left-hand side. Uh, the two major areas of concern for us were inside of the module and outside of the module lens, leading into the canopy or mounting component that I mentioned before. Uh, you can see those temperatures, max temp inside the module was 80 degrees and outside was 51.4 degrees. And all of those values are below our thermal constraints as we expected. Uh, we then simulated this prototype and achieved the results on the right-hand side of the screen. You can see there are about a six degree difference from the test results uh, that we originally got from our control sample. Uh, but that's do this does give us a good starting point. And we can also use this as relative values for future trials. And just to give you some background on this component itself, uh, this prototype is actually the first iteration that we had. Um, you can already see we reduced the volume by about three cubic centimeters. Um, and we did that by adding channels uh, to the back there of the heatsink. So as far as other simulation results, I wanted to share this. These are just two different trials. Um, we had many more iterations, but this is just going to help articulate the main takeaways. First off, the temperatures. Uh, the max temp and the outside temp were generally either lower or the same as our control simulation. Uh, so that's, that's generally good. And then as far as volume, you can see through each trial, we are reducing volume pretty significantly. We started with 58 cubic centimeters. And here in one trial is 50, the next 46, and we'll continue to move down until we get to our final. Uh, so our final simulation result, uh, the final trial yielded slightly higher temps, you can see here, than the control, but still below our constraints. And even when adding back in 10 to 15% for the simulation discrepancies that we found between the control sample and the control simulation, uh, we're still under those constraints. Um, the total volume for the final trial was 32.7 cubic centimeters. And given that this was, there's two components in this fixture, as you can see, one on the top, one on the bottom, uh, that accounts for 51.3 cubic centimeters of total volume reduction. That's how much material we removed from these combined components. And that equates to about 139 grams of material removed, uh, which is direct cost for us. And then one last point regarding this component itself. Uh, we were making these in Onshape for simulation purposes. We wanted to make these as easy and as rough as possible. Uh, not for manufacturing. So this component actually can't be manufactured. As you see it here, we're going to have to go back, replicate this component with changes that make it possible for manufacturing. Uh, but through the simulation process, that, that wasn't our main goal. Our main goal was to make things run as fast as possible and be as easy to model as possible. As far as project summary, uh, for cost savings, uh, the total uh, component material savings was 44%. And the eliminated prototype costs, uh, we had prototype costs from just the samples themselves, but also from the testing that would have needed to be done on those prototypes. Obviously, we did one prototype test for this uh, this run, but uh, to match that, we would have had to do uh, many more prototypes uh, that we eliminated through simulation. And then as far as time saving goes, uh, we saved prototyping time. It takes about one to three weeks to make each prototype. and then. The testing time for that is about one to three weeks total for all the thermal testing that we would need to do. So overall, this project was successful because it helped achieve our goal of reducing costs while still being able to maintain our current project timeline. That's all I have. Thanks for having me, guys. And I'm going to turn it back over to Nolan for questions. All right. Well, thanks so much. That was awesome, Josh. Um, yeah, it's really cool to see how you know how our tool is being used in a real world scenario to um, you know to improve your product in a, in a short time frame. Um, you know, it, it's it's amazing for me to see what you were able to accomplish uh, in a in a relatively short window of uh, uh, using our product. So again, thanks so much for sharing and being open about that. Um, it's really really cool and really really rewarding um, for our team and and I'm sure for you as well. Um, Okay, so yeah, I think this is going to kind of bring us to the end of uh, our speaking sec sessions. Um, I want to thank everybody for making time out of their busy uh, days and nights uh, to join us and uh, give us some of your attention and, and learn a little bit this uh, uh, today. But um, now I do want to just remind everybody to um, post your questions 
in the uh, in the go to webinar question field. We won't be taking any voice questions. So if you have anything that you want to see uh, answered either now or maybe followed up on, certainly now is your opportunity to reach out to either um, to either myself, uh, Josh, or Aaron at Onshape. Uh, we've gotten a couple questions now uh, already. So the first one is um, uh, focused. These are all coming from uh, one, of, one of our users, and they're focused on how does uh, Onshape compare with the likes of tools like NX, Katia, uh, and Creo? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Nolan. Yeah. So, I mean, my answer to that is really it depends on what you're doing. Like, there's there's certain things that NX and Katia will do that Creo and SolidWorks and Inventor and you know it, it all depends on what you're doing. I would say if if you're if you're not needing to do any like you know highly advanced surfacing, um, if if Onshape can address your your you know the majority of your needs, I, I would recommend that you just you know check out a, a trial and that's what I I uh, pass along to this user. Uh, I mean, there's I could I could tell you um, a thousand reasons why you should choose Onshape, but I, honestly, the best way for you to figure out if it's if it's right for your specific needs is to get in there and do a trial. Good deal. Um, yeah, and I, and I I guess I'll use that as a chance to plug as well. Um, on that note, for for SimScale, we also offer the ability to make a community level account, um, and you'll be able to get uh, access to a handful, I think, uh, to upwards of ten simulations. Um, note that when you make a community account, any model you upload, any simulation you run will um, be available on our uh, public projects. So, but that's going to be a great place for you, uh, just like Aaron said, to kind of get your, you know, get, dip your feet in the pool and get your hands a little dirty with uh, with our tool as well. Um, yeah, I think we're very similar in that regard. Um, another question uh, for you, Aaron, uh, is with regards to surfacing in uh, on shape and as well as assemblies yeah so um i will say this i we have been putting a lot of emphasis and focus into improving our surfacing tools and this is being driven by a high high priority customer who needs to do a lot of very high-end surfacing so so in the past year we've 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 added quite a lot of functionality to that tool. I think probably the the one that, that we added most recently that I think will address a lot of surfacing requirements is the boundary surface. Um, you know, we've 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 put a lot of effort into to improving these tools and adding new capabilities and, and that's just you know one example of it. I didn't quite understand the assembly levels portion of that question i i did actually ask for clarification but i mean obviously you can assemble all your all your models inside of on shape um you know it's a it's a mechanical cat tool so it's you know assemblies are essentially the the end goal of all of these designs right so we want to make sure that that uh, all the proper motion is is um available and you know you can verify all the movements etc so yeah, yeah, very good. Um, yeah, I think that, um, let's see, we have, I'll take a question for myself. Uh, so one of the questions that came across was if we, uh, uh, if you use Onshape, then, you know, why do you need SimScale? You know, so this one tool is Onshape enough. Um, I would say, again, it depends on what you're trying to do. Um, and it depends on what you're, you're looking to simulate. Um, if you need to go uh, kind of beyond, I would say, basic um, linear static FEA stress analysis, which is something Onshape has has recently put into their uh, into their tool, um, SimScale is going to extend the functionality well, well beyond that type of uh, engineering simulation. So we have we have linear static stress analysis, but beyond that, we have um, more complex, both you know, mechanical find an element analysis but also extending you know multidisciplinary multi-physics um, into areas such as computational fluid dynamics um, thermal modeling and uh, increasingly now starting to roll out uh, more and more features uh, kind of extending the physics capabilities on the cloud so i would say um, you know 
Onshape is where is an, is would be a necessary tool for creating your geometries. Um, but if you're going to be doing sort of high fidelity, uh, very advanced physics modeling, um, and you want to take that to the next level, that's where SimScale comes in. Um, that kind of dovetails into my uh, the other question we received, which is, can SimScale uh, be an add-on within Onshape? Um, we we may have some connection in the um, Onshape App Store um, or being a kind of a partner, um, but I would say it's actually kind of from my experience, it's the other way around. So SimScale has an integrated Onshape connection um, whereby you can authenticate and have access to your full Onshape design library um, to import into, into any one of your SimScale projects. So you're able to pull those in. Um, and again, that's just that's working through um, secure authentication between our two different platforms. Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions for uh, for Josh at, uh, at Kitchler, uh, do push those across as well. I know everybody wants to ask us a lot of good questions about our our stuff, but now would be time maybe to pick his brain and get his experiences. Um, we have uh, we have one for Josh. That's um, like, you know, how, how have you found the learning curve for uh, SimScale, and and what's the plan to you know, kind of deploy SimScale across your team? Yeah, thanks, Alan. So uh, it really depends on your experience. Obviously, if you have a lot of experience with simulation, this is going to be much easier for you. Um, if you don't have a lot of experience, then there are things you obviously have to learn or be able to understand in order to make this easier. So just being able to modify your model, um, in, you know, that, that can be done in Onshape, but uh, being able to modify that to be efficient for simulation, that's you know step one. And then obviously how to run efficient simulations, choosing the right mesh, things like that. Um, you know, it, it takes time if you don't have experience with simulation, but it's not um, it's not extremely difficult. And I do agree that the your support team at, at SimScale has actually been pretty good and, and it is live. So you can just chat them within the application and, and they'll look at your model while you're looking at it and, and address a question if they can. Awesome, good to hear. I will uh I'll tell some of my friends on our support team that uh, that they're doing great. <laughs> I'll pass that on. Um, hey, yeah, Nolan, another... I did have um, I, I had made a, a GIF to to show how to bring in the on shape models into SimScale, but I forgot to add it to my deck. Did you want to make me presenter and I can show it? I mean, it's not it's not crucial, I would say, but yeah, I mean, I think that'd be useful if we can get it to share. Sure. Um, yeah, get it to play up. Sure. Let me pass you present presenter because I think that would be good to see yeah it's you're right it is it's um it's as if on shape is integrated into and sorry about my background there so here we are in on shape I'm just rotating the model I hide something I jump into the sim scale tab and start a new project call it whatever you want Kishler it's a good name um and then right there you can see the import from on shape built right into the dialogue you you get access to all of your your designs all your documents you have access to the version controls once you import it, it's good to go. You're ready to start creating those simulations. So you see how fast that was and, and easy it was. And uh, I would also like to list, or well, that plays pretty fast, but uh, there was quite a lot of different uh, simulation capabilities available to you there and it's replaying now. So uh, I'll go ahead and stop sharing now, but gives you an idea just how easy it is to, to get into um, using SimScale and, and Onshape together. So uh, it's a it's a fantastic integration. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. That is a that is a great quick snapshot of how, how easy it's done. But yeah, again, it's 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 definitely um it's a pretty seamless process. Um let's see, another question. Um this one I guess is gonna be another one for you, Aaron. Uh, how does on shape fare when it uh comes to importing models from say you know, migrating from say SolidWorks? Um so SolidWorks kernel is parasolid on shapes kernel is parasolid so passing data from solidworks to on shape is actually a pretty um fluid process uh we 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 can we can bring in those assemblies we can bring in those parts um drawings is another question you'd actually have to most likely recreate some drawings if you're going to be doing a large migration we also have another partner who who will do a bulk migration it's called uh, monarch by um cad sharp very very capable team of uh, 
software developers, but if, if you have a lot of data you want to bring over from SolidWorks, uh, if you want to bring over metadata and things like that, uh, check out Monarch. It is a fantastic tool. If you're bringing over one or two assemblies at a time, it should be as simple as just, you know, import, get collecting all the correct uh, files, parts, and assemblies, and then you're, you should be good to go. Awesome. Yeah, and uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, SimScale is also built with a pair of solid CAD kernel. Um, so generally speaking, the the migration across those tools is is going to be very seamless. Um, oh, let's see. Uh, kind of a funny question here, but uh, how, how do I make this beer pouring? Uh, this was done in SimScale, so we have a built-in post processor, um, and uh, I believe most of these images that I showed here were made right in SimScale. This one may have uh, actually been exported and gussied up a little bit in an open source tool called Blender. Um, so results in SimScale can be downloaded and can be uh, you know kind of further used if uh, if you're an expert in any kind of especially software tools such as uh, rendering suites. Um, all right, uh, let's see if we have any more here for uh, here's one for Josh. Um, how has cloud-centric design and simulation changed your team's approach to product development uh, compared to how you used to do things with desktop or you know local tools? Yes, yeah, so I think Aaron mentioned some positives. Uh, Onshape um, and cloud-based, you guys well known. Uh, but the, the main stuff for us is uh, it's easy to access documents anywhere in the world uh, without having manual file sharing. I know if you're using SolidWorks, it's a lot of uh, if you're working with vendors or people in other countries who don't have the access to your drives, um, you're doing a lot of uh, sharing files through emails, things like that. Uh, but this allows also for quick updates, so we can update something instantaneously. Our vendor has it. Um, you know, they don't have to look for emails or anything like that. Uh, it's also a good way for us to collaborate with our vendors on potential changes. So, um, like our, our QA teams can have the production version of the document. And at the same time, our vendor can have a potential change version of that document at the same time. So, you know, that's that's generally beneficial for us during development, and especially my team, which you know we work on products that exist and, and we're making changes to live products. So it's always good for us during version control. And then I think one thing that's maybe not noticeable about Pondshape or, or cloud-based is it just gives us a flexibility uh, when we're talking about document permissions. Um, so we can easily give people permissions, take away permissions, uh, change which files they have access to pretty quickly. Uh, whereas if, uh, obviously if you're using something that's not cloud-based, it's, it's much harder to do that flexibly. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Josh. That's, uh, that's some interesting insights into how, you know, how, you're, how you're managing really the, uh, the PLM side of things. And I think that dovetails with uh, another question here as far as multiple users in Onshape and a given project, um, do you have to check CAD in and check it out? Um, maybe just walking through how that process works, uh, Aaron, um, or maybe even Josh, how you guys uh, work and collaborate as a team. So I'll just open that one up to anybody. Yeah, I can answer it if you want me to. Uh, yeah, you don't, you don't have to check anything out. I know that's um, obviously something that you do a non-cloud-based system. Uh, but we we have version control, so uh, you can make a version in time of a specific CAD model. We can make a revision of that version, and basically that means this is the locked-in uh, model that we're using, and um, anything going forward from that is just a different version. So you can have people working collaboratively at the same time. You don't need to uh, uh, check anything in and out. People can be making updates, making versions, even branching those versions if they want to do different versions at the same time. Of the of the exact same model, so uh, generally that's pretty easy for us. We never have any issues with people working collaboratively. Yeah, it, it, is there anything else you wanted to add to that, Aaron? Uh, no, not from not at this time. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I I mean I just wanted to say that it seems to me like the versioning in on shape um, and and um, where at least where SimScale is headed as well is Kind of sharing a lot of commonality with how software and agile software development has has progressed. So thinking about tools like maybe like GitHub, um, where again you're you're branching off 
a development path and then maybe merging in those changes um, and having a, a well-documented uh, version tree as you're going along that process um, with the ability to uh, to roll back um, if needed. And uh, yeah, I mean, I would say Onshape does work a lot like, um, the philosophy there is a lot like GitHub for, for CAD. Um, this is one for, for Aaron. Uh, can you do your own customized drawing sheets uh, with company logos and uh, backgrounds? I, I can tell you that the answer is yes, but you can go ahead and, <laughs> and elaborate. Yeah. Yeah, I'm back. Sorry, I actually had a phone call there that I could not <laughs> avoid. Unfortunately, I'm getting surgery next week. But anyway, uh, yes, you can have your own customized uh, drawing templates. Of course, you can. I can. I can. I'd be happy to share any any documentation that you'd like to see to to you know see the process involved with that. But it's it's fairly straightforward. I mean, it's, you know, you edit the template as if it were um, a sheet itself. You add any you know. Uh, metadata that you'd like to add to the the, the template and, and title block, and you should be able to share it with anyone on your team. Awesome. Yeah, good stuff. Um, all right. I think that's going to wrap it up for questions. Um, just as a reminder to everyone, um, for both uh, uh, Onshape and SimScale, um, we uh, have a uh, pretty capable um, community version of our tools. Um, and uh, are definitely willing to discuss further, um, you know, demoing and trialing of our tools uh, following this up. So um, be on the lookout for some follow-up materials, including a link to the webinar, uh, and you know, we can take things from there. Again, I want to thank all of the uh, attendees, but and I especially want to thank our guests, uh, Josh and Aaron, for taking some time out of their busy days for us as well today. Um, yeah, thanks everybody for your time. Hope everybody learned something and we'll be talking to you all real soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Nolan. Thanks, everyone.